I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. Hey, how's it going everybody? Unreal Scopes here for another Murder Monday. And today I'm doing Richard Ramirez. Now, if you don't know, he's an American serial killer. And he's kind of a shitty person. Um, he was born February 29th, 1960 in El Paso, Texas. He was the youngest of five children. He, uh... Began smoking marijuana cigarettes at the age of 10. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but marijuana's bad. It's a bad, bad drug. No, but actually, by the age of 10, it's probably pretty bad. So, he, uh, was, uh, when he was 10 years old, he would smoke, uh, weed with his, uh, his cousin, Mike. And he would always talk about, like, gory war stories and all that kind of shit. He uh, taught Richard some of his uh, military skills, such as killing with stealth and surety. Uh, Ramirez began to seek, around this time, the escape from his father's violent temper by sleeping in a local cemetery. So, as you all know, um, uh, abuse at a young age also kind of like leads to like being a serial killer and all that shit. One of the three things. Um, by the time he was 12, um, he was, like, really strongly influenced by his cousin Mike. Um, he showed him pictures of, uh, like, gruesome pictures from war, like, Polaroid photos of his victims, including Vietnamese women he had raped. In some of the photos, his cousin posed with a severed head of a woman who he had abused. <clears throat> um, by the, uh, by May 4th, 1973, so Ramirez was 13 at the time, his cousin Mike had fatally shot his wife Jessie in the face with a 38 caliber revolver during a domestic argument, um, and Richard was actually there when that happened, like, he witnessed that firsthand. After the shooting, uh, Richard be, uh, became sullen and withdrawn from his family and peers. And later that year, he moved in with his older sister, Ruth, and her husband, Roberto, who, <laughs> and this is what the article says, was an obsessive peeping Tom who took Richard along on his nocturnal exploits. So, by 13 years old, Richard was abused by his father, was smoking weed, Hanging out with his cousin who talked about raping and killing women in Vietnam. Witnessed his first murder. Like, this kid just, he, he had, like, the literally serial killer. <laughs> and around this time, he began using LSD and cultivated an interest in Satanism. Um, Mike was not found guilty of Jesse's murder, however, by reason of sanity, because of his combat record as a mitigating... Well, they used his combat record as a mitigating factor. And he was released in 1977 after four years of incarceration at the Texas State Mental Hospital. Um, <clears throat> so, around this time, Richard started getting sexual fantasies of violence, including forced bondage and rape. While still in school, he took a job at a local Holiday Inn, where he used his passkey to rob sleeping patrons. His employment ended abruptly after a hotel guest returned to his room to find Ramirez attempting to rape his wife. Though the husband beat Ramirez senseless at the scene, criminal charges were dropped when the couple who lived out of state declined to return to testify against him. Ramirez uh, then dropped out of uh, Jefferson High School in the ninth grade. At the age of 22, he moved to California where he settled down permanently. Once he was in California, that's when his, murder st his murdering began. Uh, from what I can tell, it started about two years after he moved there. Um, this is just the murders that we know of, so it could have started, you know, as soon as he moved there, for all we know. But, we're gonna get right into it, and I'm gonna tell you, it gets pretty fucking gross. So, this is a major warning. On April 10th of 1984, Ramirez murdered a nine-year-old, uh, girl called... 
Mei Ling, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that name wrong, uh, in a hotel basement where he was living. Uh, he raped and beat the girl before stabbing her to death and hanged her body from a pipe. This is his first known killing, like I said, which was not initially identified as being connected to his crime spree. In 2009, his DNA was matched to a sample obtained at the crime scene. 2016 officials disclosed evidence of a second suspect identified through a DNA sample retrieved from the crime scene. Who is believed to have been present in, at her murder. Authorities have not publicly ident identified the suspect described as being a juvenile at the time and have not brought charges due to the lack of evidence. So that's not something I knew. He, there was a second person there that they just never brought charges to because they don't have quite enough evidence but they got his DNA at the crime. And I'm assuming DNA means sperm, so I mean, like, I don't know. That's kind of shitty. On June 28th, 1984, 79-year-old Jenny Vincow was brutally was found brutally murdered in her apartment. She had been stabbed repeatedly while sleeping in her bed, and her throat slashed so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. Ramirez's fingerprint was found on a mesh screen he removed to gain access through an open window. Now, I remember reading somewhere that uh, Richard Ramirez would only kill people if they when if they could get into their house. Like, if the door was open, or if the, obviously, if the window was unlocked. On March 17th, 1985, Ramirez attacked a 22-year-old Maria Hernandez outside her home in Rosemead, shooting her in the face with a 22 caliber handgun after she pulled into her garage. She survived when the bullet ricocheted off the keys she had held in her hands as she lifted them to protect herself. Inside the house was her roommate, uh, Dale o Okazaki, 34, who heard the gunshot and ducked behind the counter when she saw Ramir D Dale, D-A-Y-L-E, Dali? I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, but I thought <laughs> she, uh, she saw Ramirez enter the kitchen when she raised her head, he shot her once in the forehead, killing her. Within, uh, within an hour of the Rosemead home invasion, Ramirez pulled 30-year-old Cy Leon Veronica Yu out of her car in Monterey, Mon Monterey, Monterey Park, Monterey, Monterey Park, shot her twice with a 22 caliber handgun and fled. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. The two murders and third attempt in a single day attracted extensive coverage from news media who dubbed the curly-haired attacker with bulging eyes and wide-spaced rotting teeth the walking killer and the valley intruder. On March 27, 1985, Ramirez entered a home that he had burglarized a year earlier at approximately 2 a.m. and killed the sleeping Vincent Zazari, age 64, with a gunshot to his head from a 22 caliber handgun. Zazari's wife, Maxine, age 44, was awakened by her husband's murder, and Ramirez beat her and bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While uh, Richard ransacked the room, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed. It was not loaded, however. An infuriated Ramirez shot her three times with the, with the 22, then fetched a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times and gouged out her eyes and placed them in a jewelry box which he left with. The autopsy determined that mutilations were post-mortem. Ramirez left footprints with a pair of avia sneakers and the flower beds, which the police uh, photographed and cast. This was virtually the only evidence that the police had at the time. Bolts found on the scene were matched to those found at previous attacks, and the police realized the serial killer was at large. Vincent and Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. On May 14, 1985, Ramirez returned to uh, Monterey Park and entered the home of Bill, Bill Doy, 66, and his disabled wife Lillian, 56. Surprising Doy in his bedroom, Ramirez shot him in the face with a 22 semi-automatic pistol as Doy went for his own handgun. After be uh, beating the mortally wounded man into unconsciousness, Ramirez entered Lillian's bedroom, bound her with uh, thumb cuffs. There, uh... A metal restraining device that uh, locked thumbs proximity to, proximity to each other. So I'm assuming he bound her hands in front of her. Then he raped her after he had ransacked the home for valuables. Bill Doy died of his injuries while in the hospital. On the night of May 29, 1985, 
Uh, Ramirez drove a stolen Mercedes Benz and stopped at the, at the house of Mabel May Bell, 83, and her sister Florence Nettie Lang, 81. Finding a hammer in the kitchen, he bludgeoned and bound the invalid Lang in her bedroom, then bound and bludgeoned Bell before using an electrical cord to shock the women. He, uh, I'm pretty sure he took a lamp and, you know, ripped that apart and used that to shock them. Um, after Lang, he used Mabel Bell's lipstick to draw a pentagram on her thigh, as well as on the walls of both bedrooms. Uh, discovered two days later, both women were found alive but comatose. Bell later died of her injuries. The next day, he drove the same car and snuck into the home of Carol Kyle, 42. At, gun at gunpoint, he wound Kyle and her 11-year-old son with handcuffs and ransacked the house. He released Kyle to direct him to where the family's valuables were and he then sodomized her repeatedly. He also repeatedly ordered her not to look at him, telling her at one point that he would cut her eyes out. He fled the scene after retrieving the child from the closet and binding the two together again with the handcuffs. July 2nd, 1985. He drove a stolen Toyota uh, and randomly selected the house of Mary Louise Cannon, 75. After quietly entering the widowed grandmother's home, he found her asleep in her bedroom. He bludgeoned her into it into unconsciousness with a lamp and then repeatedly stabbed her using a 10-inch butcher knife from her kitchen. She was found dead at the crime scene. July 5th, 1985. Ramirez broke into the home of Sierra Madre and bludgeoned 16-year-old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she slept in her bedroom. After searching in vain for a knife in the kitchen, Ramirez attempted to strangle the girl with a telephone cord. He he was startled to see sparks emanate from the cord, and when the, his victim began to breathe, he fled the house, believing that Jesus Christ had intervened to save her. Bennett survived the savage beating, which required 478 stitches to close the, lac the lacerations to her scalp. July 7th, 1985. Ramirez burglarized the home of Joyce Lucille Nelson, 61, in Monterey Park. Finding her asleep on her living room couch, he beat her to death using his fists and kicking her in the head. A shoe print from an avi avi avia sneaker was left imprinted on her face. After cruising two other neighborhoods, he returned to Monterey Park and chose the home of Sophie Dickman, 63. He assaulted and handcuffed her at gunpoint, attempted to rape her, and stole her jewelry. When she swore to him that he had taken everything of value, he told her to, to and I quote, swear on Satan. So he's just a really shitty person. Like, I don't know, like... The swear on Satan. The stupid uh, pentagrams he's drawing. Like, I think it's really just... Obviously, some sort of fucking mental issues. But it's also, like... I don't know. I, I, I can't even, like, put what I'm trying to say into words, really. Alright, moving on. On July 20th, 1985, Ramirez purchased a machete before driving a stolen Toyota. He chose the home of Leela Needing, 66, and her husband, Max, in 68. He burst into the sleeping couple's bedroom and hacked them with a machete, then killed them with shots to the head from a 22 caliber handgun. He further mutilated the bodies with the machete before robbing the house of valuables. After quickly fencing the stolen items from the Needing residence, he drove to Sun Valley. At approximately 4.15 a.m., he broke into the home of the Covenant family. He murdered uh, Chanaron Covenant by shooting the sleeping man in the head with his uh, .25 caliber hand his handgun, killing him instantly. He then repeatedly ra raped some ki kid Covenant and beating and sodomizing her. He bound the couple's terrified eight-year-old son before dragging some kid around the house to reveal the location of any va valuable items, which he stole. During his assault, he demanded that she swear to Satan that she was not hiding any money from him. On August 6, 1985, Ramirez drove to Northridge and broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. Ramirez crept into the bedroom, startling Virginia, 27, prompting him to shoot her in the face. He then shot Chris Peterson in the temple and attempted to flee. Chris Peterson fought back while avoiding being hit by two more shots during the struggle before Ramirez managed to escape. The couple did survive. On August 8, 1985, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Diamond Bar and chose the home of Sakino Abuath, 27, and her husband Elias Abuath, 31. Sometime after 2.30 a.m., he entered the house and went into the master bedroom. He instantly killed the sleeping Elias with a shot to the head. 
He handcuffed and beat Sakina while forcing her to reveal the locations of the family's jewelry, then brutally raped and sodomized her. He repeatedly demanded her that she, quote, swear on Satan, that she would not scream during his assaults. When the couple's three-year-old son entered the bedroom, Ramirez tied the child up and then continued to rape Sakina. After Ramirez left the home, Sakina untied her son and sent, sent him to the neighbors for help. So around this time, uh, Ramirez decided he was going to leave Los Angeles, and he had the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, he had been following the news coverage and realized that, you know, okay, they kind of know what, what, where I'm doing my thing at. So he went over to San Francisco Bay. On August 18, 1985, he entered the home of Peter and Barbie Pan. He shot Peter, age 66, in the temple in his sleep. Then beat and sexually abused Barbara, age 62, before he shot her in the head and left her for dead. At the crime scene, Ramirez used lipstick to scrawl a pentagram and the phrase, Jack the Knife, on the bedroom wall. When it was discovered that the ballistics and shoe print evidence from the Night Stalker crime scenes matched the Le Pan crime scene, Mayor of San Francisco, Diane Feinstein, divulged the information in a televised press conference. The leak actually pissed off the uh, detectives on the case because they knew, uh, Ramirez is watching the news, and um, this gave him an op- uh, the opportunity to destroy uh, ev- evidence. Ramirez, who had indeed been watching the the news, dropped his size 11 and a half avia sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge that same night. He remained in the area for a few more days before heading back to the Los Angeles area. On August 24th, 1985, Ramirez traveled 76 miles south of Los Angeles in a stolen orange Toyota. That night he arrived at the home of James Romero Jr. who had just returned from a family vacation. Romero's son, 13 year old James Romero III, happened to be awake and heard Ramirez's footsteps outside the house. Thinking that there was a prowler, James went to wake his parents and Ramirez fled the scene. James raced outside and was able to note the color, make, and style of the car, as well as a partial license plate number. Romero con- Romero contacted the police with this information, believing James had chased away a thief. After this encounter, Ramirez broke into the house of Bill Carnes, 30, and his fiancée Inez Erickson, 29, through a back door. Ramirez entered the bedroom of the speaking couple and awakened Carnes when he cocked his uh, handgun. He shot Carnes three times in the head before turning, before turning his attention to Erickson. Ramirez told the terrified woman that he was the Night Stalker and forced her to swear she loved Satan as he beat her with his fist and bound her with neckties from the closet. After stealing what he could he, what he could find, he dragged Erickson to another room to rape and sodomize her. He then demanded cash and more jewelry, making Erickson swear on Satan that there was no more. Before leaving the home, Ramirez told Erickson, tell them the Night Stalker was here. Erickson untied herself and went to the neighbor's house to get help for her severely injured fi- fiancé. Surgeons were able to remove two of the bolts from his head and he survived the injuries. Erickson was able to give a detailed description of the assailant to investigators, and police were able to obtain a cast of Ramirez's footprint from the Merrill home. The stolen car was found on August 28th, and police were able to obtain a single fingerprint from the rearview mirror despite Ramirez's careful efforts to wipe the car clean of his prints. The print was positively identified as belonging to Ramirez, who is described as a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a long rap sheet that included many arrests for traffic and illegal drug violations. Law enforcement officials decided to release to the media a mugshot of Ramirez from the December 12, 1984 arrest for car theft, and the Night Stalker finally had a face. At the police press conference, it was announced, we know who you are now, and soon everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide. So August 30th, 1985, he took a bus to Arizona and visit his brother. He didn't even realize that the police knew who he was and all that shit. Um, he actually failed to meet with his brother, so he returned to Los Angeles on August 31st uh, in the morning. He walked right past police officers who were staying out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee on an outbound bus. So they weren't even looking at the inbound buses for him, and he just kind of strolled right past them. Uh, he went to a convenience store in East Los Angeles, and after noticing a group of elderly, elderly Mexican women fearfully identifying him as El Matador, or the killer, Ramirez saw his face in the covers on the newspaper rack and fled the store in a panic. He ran across the Santa Ana freeway. He attempted to carjack a woman, but was chased away by, by, bleh, chased away by bystanders who pursued him. 
After hopping several fences and attempting two more car jackings, he was eventually subdued by a group of residents, one of whom had struck him over the head with a metal bar in the pursuit. A group held Ramirez down, relentlessly beating him until police arrived and took him into custody. Like, it was a whole group of people, like, like just chased him and, like, literally were beating the shit out of him. I'm pretty sure there was, like, one, one a couple of people that had to, like, kind of hold other people back from killing him. So these people actually, like, uh, like, chased him down, what, like, tackled him to the ground. One guy made him sit on the curb, and the neighbors made sure he didn't get up, even though he begged them to let him go, claiming that some guys, quote-unquote, were chasing him. He was saying things like, hey, let me go, come on, let me go. And, uh, it was a few moments later that people realized that they had captured, and people started coming out and saying that he's the killer, but they kept saying, El Matan, El Matan. And they started beating him. And he, the only reason he didn't die is because the cops showed up. And, uh, someone kept, said that in Spanish that, uh, someone said that he was shouting in Spanish, it's me, it's me, I'm lucky the cops caught me. Because <laughs> he uh, definitely would have died, like, from the mob. So jury selection for the case started July 22nd, 1988. At his first court appearance, Ramirez raised his hand with a pentagram drawn on it and yelled, Hail Satan. August 3rd, 1988, report, uh, Los Angeles Times reported that some jail employees overheard Ramirez planning to shoot the prosecutor with a gun, which Ramirez intended to have smuggled into the courtroom. Consequently, a metal detector was installed, installed outside the courtroom, and intensive searches were conducted on people entering. August 14th, the trial was interrupted because one of the jurors, Phyllis Singletary, did not arrive at the courtroom. Later that day, she was found shot to death in her apartment. The jury was terrified. They could not help wonder if Ramirez had somehow directed this event from inside his prison cell, and if he could reach other jury members. However, Ramirez was not responsible for her death. She had been shot and killed by her boyfriend, who later committed suicide with the same weapon in a hotel. The alternate juror who replaced her was too frightened to return to her home. On September 20th, 1989, he was convicted of all charges, 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murder, 11 sexual assaults, 14 burglaries. During the penalty phase of the trial on November 7th, 1989, he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. He stated, he stated to reporters after the death sentences, Big deal. Death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. The trial cost $1.8 million, which in today's dollars, $3.64 million, which at, the same, which at the time made it the most expensive in the history of California, until surpassed by the O.J. Simpson murder case in 1994. So during his trial, much like Ted Bundy, he actually had fangirls, like, sending him mail and things like that. And he, re he actually proposed to this uh, woman named Doreen Leoy, uh, on October 3rd, 1996, they were married in California Saint San Quentin State Prison. For many years before ma uh, his death, Leoy stated that she would commit suicide when he was executed. However, they eventually separated. By some estimates, he would have been in his early 70s before his execution was carried out due to the lengthy California appeals process. Now, that is fucking stupid. Because he was caught, when did I say? He was August. Okay, now he was, okay, let's just say when he was sentenced to death. He was sentenced to death on November 7th, 1989. <clears throat> November 7th, 1989. And he was born 1960. So he was 29 years old when he was convicted. So you're telling me he's going to be in prison for another 41 years before his death is carried out? Are you serious? Like, that is absolutely insane to me. Like... If you're put on death row, like, I understand there are appeals and things. I get that. Like, not everyone on death row is guilty. That has been proven time and time again. But he was clearly guilty. He showed no remorse for what he did. He admitted to what he did. Like, it's just, it's, for the people that are obviously guilty, the people that have absolutely 100% done this, 30 am I, 41 years 41 years on death row before he would have been put to death that is absolutely insane but because it's such a long process he died of complications of secondary B cell lymphoma on June 7th 2013 
He had also been affected by chronic substance abuse and chronic hepatitis C, the viral infection. And he died at 53 years old. He had been on death row for more than 23 years. Now, I understand completely that there are appeals. I get that. 23 years is a long fucking time. Does it, in our constitution it says a right to a fair and speedy trial. So that should be even with the appeals. There should be, you file an appeal, it's, it's set up quick as hell. Like, you, like, it's, it's so mind-boggling to me. It really is, like, I know people have been, like, wrongly convicted. Some people have been wrongly put to death, and I understand all of that. I am not, I don't know. It's, it's absolutely insane. It's mind-boggling to me. I'm gonna go off on a tangent if I don't end this here soon. So because he was not actually executed by the state of California, he had no actual last words. But these words were spoken near his, during his trial, which just shows how fucking stupid it is that he was not put to death sooner. I am beyond good and evil. I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells, Lucifer dwells in us all. He did not give a fuck. Fucking should have killed him. Within the first fucking five years of him being in fucking prison. He, everyone knew what he did. He admitted to what he did, plain and simple. Alright guys, that has been Murder Monday. That has been Richard Ramirez. Obviously, uh, what I covered is just the tip of the iceberg concerning his childhood. Like, pretty much I just covered the murders. I didn't cover much of the trial or anything like that. You know, uh, there's a lot more information out there. But... I will see you guys over on the live stream. Adios.